Okay, Rob Murphy. Jim, hi. Hello, you are the director of Splice Here. Yes, a projected odyssey. Yes. In a nutshell, describe this movie for us. Well, it's, at its simplest, I guess, it's an exploration of what has happened to film in the first decade of digital projection. But greater than that, it's, it's sort of a, um, a love letter to film, if you will, and an adventure, my own. Um, I sort of begrudgingly became the storyteller a couple of years into shooting because we realised we needed somebody to do that. Uh, so yeah, I had to step in front of the camera and uh, to sort of help create a backbone to the entire story because I talk about film restoration, um, the survival of prints, how we're going to see them in the future, all from the projectionist point of view. Because you were a projectionist, you are uh, a, a very well-known editor of films. Can you just tell us a bit about your projection history? Been a projectionist for about 18 years now. Um, so I started here at The Sun in 2004 because uh, I had a, a, a mate who was the chief here and they were looking for someone and it was the only part of the process I hadn't worked in yet so I really wanted to try it and I just took to it. Um, so I got to see the last seven years or so of film right, um, and work in that way and of course all multiplexes by then and I worked here and the Nova mostly but did a stint at the Astor as well. So um, yeah, I I got to see the end, the tail end of um, of film, and it was it was pretty crazy towards the end there because um, even though I'd been trained up, a lot of chop toppers had been trained to be projectionists. That's you know, no, I'm not putting down chop, chop toppers, toppers at meaning all. just just people from front of house or people who'd been brought in off the street yeah. from people who would sell you the popcorn yeah. and the Maltesers and the twisties yeah. and so on. They were then trained up to operate digital camera, uh, digital projectors. No, well, no, to run the film projectors. To run the film projectors. So sorry. They were given, you know, just enough inf information to be able to lace up the machine and press go, which meant that a lot of the finesse and the, you know, the actual detail of projection really suffered in that last decade leading up to 2010. So, um, I did want you to just unpack what it was you were observing with that change to digital or yeah when you saw these um uh other cinema employees being sort of given minimal training to operate cameras uh, operate projectors mm. in the cinema as digital was coming in what were you observing about the change in the culture well it was a i mean it was a huge change it's the projectionist there's sort of like three generations of projectionists. There's, there's the guys who started from the beginning and they, they often uh, had a, a job for life and they spent their entire working life in one tiny black room projecting films and they knew it back the front. Then there was the multiplex projectionists like myself who were trained up as well but not to the level that the first generation were. Um, we could do maintenance, we could do some, you know, trouble spotting, but if something really broke down, that would be it, you'd cancel the session. Um, and then there were the, uh, like I say, the chock toppers, and I, 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 a lot of those people uh, took a great interest in it and got trained up to a high level, but a lot of them didn't, and so a lot of film got damaged. Um, a lot of shows were projected badly, and that, that was that, the, the 2000s. Um, uh, and the teens, uh, no, just just the 2000s, so leading up to 2010. So, uh, and then digital came in, and digital can be broken into two sections too, because uh, a lot of people might remember, or probably trying to forget, there was this there was this interim period between film and um, proper DCI spec projection, and, and that was e cinema. So e cinema meant, you know, your domestic. Um, MP4 or your MOV file or the things that we use, you know, on our computers, um, they were being delivered from the distributors and they weren't mastered properly. The people that were doing them, uh, quite often they were coming from 25 frames a second to 24 and they weren't getting the conversion right, so you're getting skips and jumps and things. 
and these were being uh, run on data projectors, like domestic data projectors. And so they were constantly breaking down and the computers were terrible and the sound wasn't encoded properly and it was really horrible. And a lot of projectionists voluntarily left the profession at that point because they just hated what they were being made to do. Then proper DCI spec um, projection came in, which meant that there was a specification that everybody had to run, uh, and we're, we're running DCP packages. So that's dinner, uh, digital cinema packages. And these uh, are all you know, done exactly the same way. They're all locked with keys. And finally, we've got a, a specification that we can work to. But those early days were really rough as well because the projectors kept breaking down. We'd, you'd come into work and suddenly there'd be half the screen would be purple or it'd be upside down or it would be completely white or completely blue. And with those, it was just call a technician because it's a computer. There's, there's no way anybody can, can be trained up on all of that to be a projectionist. It's, it's very, very specialised. And so that meant there are a lot, of, a lot of bad shows and a lot of lost shows in those first few years. Right. But now we have full-on digital projection in cinemas. We're in our third generation of projectors now. So the first generation were able to do 24 frames per second only. The second, uh, a lot of other specs improved as well. Um, the second set, uh, we, can, we can show different frame rates. The third set now are laser-based and they do really do deliver a much better picture. It's actually a, approaching film now, but it's taken it's taken 10 years to get here, and I, I think we jumped on the digital bandwagon a bit early. Okay. I don't think we were ready. About what span of time did you make this film? Well, ten, it's taken 10 years, and that, that was not by design, uh, because it's, it was all privately, it's privately made and, and was privately funded up until 2010 when Screen Australia and Vic Screen came on board, but the film was, was completely shot by then. Um, so it, it started off as something very small. Um, it was just kind of a... So just to clarify, 2010, you mean 2020? Uh, it, it, no, we started in 2010. You started shooting in 2010? Yeah, okay, yeah sorry. roughly, yeah, right. yeah. Around about that change. And it was, it was because of the change that I kind of thought, well, somebody needs to be documenting this. Or because I'm a filmmaker first and a projectionist second, maybe I just thought... I, I need to capture this before it all disappears because when it started changing it, it was changing very quickly. Uh, so, yeah. You mentioned in the film uh, how projectors that had been there for a long time were, were basically being thrown out. Yeah. Yeah. A, a lot of things just went to land, landfill. Um, yeah. It, it was a lot. Things, things just generally kind of get pushed aside in a buyer box for a while because it's always a hurry when we're putting something new in um, because you can't lose shows and so something would be taken out and maybe just pushed to the side for a little while and then eventually we needed more space for something else that's when it would get thrown mm -hmm. away and it would always and it would it was always be a decision by management um, way after the fact usually so the projectionists the people who really cared about the the stuff and thought I need to give this find a new home or put it in my garage or sell it on or something the management weren't really interested in selling things mm. just just get it out of here the film is built around is a lot of it is structured around the screening in 70 millimeter of the hateful eight yeah with Quentin Tarantino appearing here and so on and all the trouble that you went to mm. in order to install the equipment yeah in order to project the film onto the screen in the manner that he wanted it. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm going to just give you this <laughs> as, as a, a, I guess as a palpable totem of the tension that I think y you illustrated in this film. On the one hand, yeah. there is the love of old school big screen 70 millimeter film projection at the same time you do acknowledge and i think demonstrate mm. how awesome digital is there mm. is in fact one i think beautiful 
ironic sequence where you're showing uh, you know a, a, a film projected on film you need some equipment so you got to go into the back shed to try to find some doodad yeah. and you're filming it with an iPhone yes so you wouldn't have been able to film that with um, a film camera and you do say in the film that you could have made this film on film a absolutely um, you have to acknowledge that and all the way along I hope that I've been able to show the digital is not the bad guy it's just people well we, we think in terms of black and white these days it's, it's either it's either zero or ten and there's no shade of gray in between digital is not the replacement for film it's a new medium and it has a whole heap of wonderful things that it can bring to us and will um, but it's it won't look like it won't ever look like film and it doesn't have to you know, it's a new medium with the whole history of recorded storytelling uh, is littered with with different formats that lended their own technical um, look to the story that was recorded on them and they're as much as a part of the, the, the ethos of that film as the story itself and so to see to see a um, something shot on 65 or you know released in 70 reduced to a 4k digital representation it's going to look different it's it's going to look great but it's going to look different now the reason why i brought that little uh thank you because i gave my copy to someone and mm. i don't know where he is now yeah oh i'm not giving that to you i'm <laughs> oh, just okay, to show it to you right. unless <laughs> hang on unless do you want so you gave your I, copy I don't, away. yeah i gave my copy away i don't know where it is uh, but the reason why i brought that is because th there you have um, a demonstration on the one hand it was so beautifully shot that film mm. 70 millimeter but it is now preserved um, pretty much in a, in a very sturdy format you can watch it anywhere you can watch it on your computer you can watch it on a big screen at home so there's digital in a way giving new life to uh, an old school format and the tension in the film is the one between this nostalgia that you have and it's in the film for old school film but at the same time Rob I, I gotta ask gotta say mm. that the cinema experience as we like to call it um, is promoted the myth of the sanctity of the cinema experience I think it's promoted in your film because on, when it's perfect, when it's just you in a big cinema with a big screen with not enough other people to distract you, it is absolutely awesome. Mm. Also, when it's a crowded cinema, all totally immersed in a film, mm. that too is without parallel. Yeah. It is incredible. Yeah. At the same time, as we know, the cinema experience can be subject to many compromises people eating drinking babies undisciplined kids mobile phones of course mm. but at home yeah. you can actually set yourself up to watch a film in near pristine conditions where you have complete control over that hateful eight for instance you can project it on your home theater and see it beautifully mastered uh, just sit back no distractions watch it on headphones and get the full audio experience as well ah but you're not getting the full experience so that's the thing yeah tell, tell us about that well um yes you can get a beautiful reproduction but it's always going to be a reproduction and it's dependent on what your television is whether you have an lcd whether you have a plasma plasmas look are a lot better at reproducing the film look LCDs are terrible at making they completely change the way it looks they'll make a movie look like something shot on video it's it's bright and it's colorful and it's beautiful but it's not authentic that's right don't buy a Samsung TV <laughs> <laughs> no words so it, it's all about when people come and see the hateful eight our 70 mil print and it's projected in ultra panavision it's done properly uh, 
I've had friends of mine who are my age who caught the end of you know the widescreen era and we know what it's supposed to look like and they just come up to me afterwards and one one person said you know I had no idea it could look like that and that spoke mountains to me it's that okay we need to preserve this or for a couple of reasons so that people can make the comparison an informed comparison because the um, the uh, what's the word um, the ease of just putting a disc in at home or you know calling up Netflix and pressing play it'll give you a great experience but it won't give you what Quentin Tarantino intended you to see mm. now this is a serious point about the continued use of film there are top tier directors but there are also um, mm. I guess lower tier directors Absolutely. who want to shoot on film now it might have initially been considered as the last hurrah for film uh, but when you have filmmakers like Christopher Nolan Tarantino, Spielberg and you know many others yeah who the studios can't say no to where Christopher Nolan is mm. you know saying I want to sh you know, I'm shooting this on film and his films you know make a billion dollars each they're obviously not going to say no no you've got to shoot it on digital well, well yeah. he has the power to say I want to shoot it on IMAX yeah well yes <laughs> which uh, is you know that's yeah. a big call yeah. so seriously Rob what do you think the future of filmmakers shooting on film is going to be is it the last hurrah or do you think that filmmakers actually now have a taste they really appreciate the image difference that film can bring oh they, to... they absolutely do i mean film is it's already um has a stable position as an originating format with hollywood a lot of hollywood films now are shot on 35 then scanned and then the rest of the post process is, is digital of course and I think that's the happy medium, is because we still retain that romantic film look uh, that's kind of entrenched in the art form now, but we have the convenience of delivering it digitally at a cinema. Um, as long as that cinema has their projector set up properly. Uh, I, I still think digital projection is not quite there. As I was saying before, the, the laser ones, yes. Um, the DLPs, are, they're still you get green blacks, um, not quite as sharp in places, and just a flatter image. Mm. It's when you see film projected, because you're forcing light through a physical object, it, it's a completely different, and it's bouncing back off the screen at you, it's a completely different experience. And it's not until people make the comparison that they go, oh, this looks great at home, but oh my God, I saw it at, at the cinema and it looked incredible. Do you believe that it is a matter of conditioning we now have at least two generations mm. of young people who have grown up with watching things on their devices mm. and watching things that have been shot on digital that they are perhaps uh, less conditioned and perhaps Rob even less interested in the difference in image quality that you on the one hand can say if you shoot it on film it's got these wonderful organic qualities and it looks mm. better and it looks richer and the image is deeper and they might say yeah well you know i'm watching if i'm watching it on tv on my big screen um i that might be the case but it doesn't really make that much difference to me as a young person having grown up watching things digitally on devices what do you think uh definitely i mean every generation is conditioned uh, in that way um, I think that convenience is a two-bladed sword uh, yes it does make people lazy uh, in, in terms of wanting to see more I mean maybe yes maybe these people uh, these generations they, they see these um, digital uh, representations and they're happy with that they're used to it that's that's what they know but it's they probably haven't gone out and seen that film presented on film. Now, I'd like to ask you just about the realities of releasing a film in today's market. Mm. Uh, we are here at the beautiful Sun Theatre in Yarraville, and I greeted you out 
the front and as we walked in um, you had a nice little sandwich board for your film mm -hmm. because the Sun Theatre is part of the film and it's in the film. Yeah. As we walked past there was this huge billboard for Avatar. the new Avatar film. <laughs> uh, so good luck kids. That What are the realities of releasing an independently made documentary in today's market? If you had to distribute it yourself, it would obviously be harder. I mean, with potential films is distributing my film, which is fantastic, and they know how to do that. But it, look, it's really difficult. It's it's really hard to get bums on seats. Um, we've had this perfect storm of mishaps for the, for the cinema industry, being COVID, um, people changing their viewing habits because they've had to, being stuck at home, and the studios or the, exhibit, the um, distribution chains taking um, the precedent that they've wanted for so long to remove or drastically shrink the, the, the theatrical window. So now it, it gives people even less incentive to come to the movies because they, they know all they have to do is wait for a week or they can probably see it at the same time on their TV. So, um, but yeah, people's viewing habits have, have really changed and it's um look, the other thing is uh i i think that the industry has has shifted so far towards tentpole franchises like you know the marvel universe and all, all the franchises that are built into that on one hand that's the way that they've been um combating tv which can do long-form storytelling and so we're trying to do long-form storytelling at the movies uh so I, I know why that's happened, but the fact that you, the studios make a film that has to make a billion dollars in its first week or fortnight of release in order to break even, um, that's not good for them, but it's not good for everybody else either, because that trickle down effect, th these are the only films now that bring the big audiences, like the full cinema audiences, that, these are the only films that do that now. And I hope that we'll we'll get back to people coming back to the cinema for all kinds of films, but at the moment, uh, it means that the exhibitors are also very much dependent on these tentpole films doing really well. And so, if they don't, it's this trickle down effect. Uh, it's really tough in the exhibition world at the moment. Yeah, the issue of the window between cinema release and platform release, I think, is central to the change that's happening at the moment and that you're part of, mm. as are a lot of other young filmmakers, in that if something is released in the cinema that's mm. going to be on a platform in two or four weeks' time, it, the argument is very strong. Why are you going to pay, mm. you know, to see a film, you know, for a ticket that's going to cost you twice what it costs for a monthly subscription to see a film one time yeah. in, in the cinema. And I'm, as a reviewer, I'm part of the problem because I'm, I raise this issue in reviews saying, this is a good film, um, you know, it's very entertaining, but if you wait four weeks, you can see it at home as many times as you like yeah. on the subscription that you already own. So the decision is yours, but you know, it is a, it's a valid challenge, um, you know, to the ticket buyer, and also to the culture. They've yeah. got to get back to... Yeah, the convenience mm. is a real... Yeah. It's a real monster mm. uh, because it's just... It's it's too convenient. Mm. People will reach out for that. Unless they really love seeing the movies, you know, properly and immersively, um, but that's kind of, you know, that's the cinephile part of the community. Mm. And they're the people that will come back to the movies. Um, you know, when COVID drops away, because there's still that in the back of people's minds. Every time there's a flare up, the older movie goes, will stop coming. So that's, that's really hurting us as well. What's been the response to the film? What's been its journey? It's been a brilliant response so far. I, I couldn't be happier. I mean, getting into MIF for the premiere was just wonderful and being, you know, the home the home ground, the home game, so to speak, and, and the Melbourne Festival was, was just a brilliant experience. Uh, people loved it there. We went to Cinefest Oz after that, so I popped over to Perth. Uh, yeah, people seemed to love it there too. Again, there was the problem of low attendances across all the films. Um, 
again because of you know COVID and people's viewing habits. It has been uh, we took it to Bradford, which is where we shot the the epilogue in the film. Took it back there, and that was kind of like you know the, the target audience, and yeah, they they really loved it. Uh, and it's played also at Doc NYC. Uh, I wasn't able to go, but that's America's biggest documentary uh, festival, so that was a fantastic opportunity. One of the really haunting parts of the film is when you visit these old movie houses out in the middle of nowhere and almost frozen in time mm. are these huge projectors in these derelict movie houses that appear to have just been untouched mm. since they were well, abandoned and so on. Did you know anything about that before you went out to film them? Did you Had you heard about these almost totemistic um, uh, projectors out there in the middle of nowhere. Well, not that particular one. There are lots of wonderful coincidences that happened. Uh, a group of friends and I went up to, uh, we did the um, the silo uh, tour where all the, the grain silos have been painted and I don't want to say where because I don't want to pinpoint where this town is. Um, but um, uh, my partner went looking for uh, cinemas that were in that area and we found this one and got in touch with the right person and yes this this bio box uh, this projection booth had been untouched for decades and everything was just left there I mean there was so much in that room and and everything that's shot we didn't touch anything so even the <laughs> the instructions for the Westrex uh, amplifier which were sitting kind of scrumpled up on the on the makeup bench that was exactly where we found it. We did not dress that set at all. It really was a time capsule. And, and there are a lot more up there too, out in the country like that. I was speaking to the one lab that we have, which is in Sydney, Neg Lab. Um, they are run off their feet with young filmmakers shooting on film. So. Um, People are now, people are seeking it out as, a, as another a point of difference, a point of artistic difference, I think. And uh, I don't think it's going to go away. It's just going to become, it's, it's kind of good really, because it's going to, get, it's going to revert back to a, an artistic niche. Um, and being an art form, that's where it always should be really. So I, I think it's just, it's going to survive beautifully as, as an art form again. The other interesting thing, which is contrary now to what I said before about young people being conditioned uh, to a certain type of image quality, mm. having said that, there is also a very noticeable love from young artists mm. for analogue. Yeah. They love cassettes and vinyl records yeah. and old school film. They love the tactile feel, it seems, and the quality that you get from old analog devices. Yeah, and it's a different experience. Again, I'm not going to say it's better or worse, but it's undeniably different, and that's what people are attracted to. I think because of the, the tiny imperfections in any sort of analog recording are what give it more of a human connection. Whereas digital or sterile, it's perfect every single time, but it's a little bit dead for that reason. Uh, analog is more relatable in, in some way. Yeah. Uh, look, the other thing, oh, I will tell you one. But, um, there's a, uh, speaking of analog recordings, there's a, um, a print. We, we have one of the few 70 mil prints of Pink Floyd's The Wall uh, still here in Melbourne, and it's gone completely red from vinegar syndrome, unfortunately but it does have the six track magnetic sound. And unlike many other films, um, Pink Floyd mixed, did a separate mix just for these film tracks uh, that was different to the master recording. And if you get to hear the wall, we still run it from time to time because people come in just to listen to it. It's the most magnificent sound experience you've ever heard on, on film, uh, on any recording. Um, and it just has that, that richness and that depth that uh, analog can deliver. Yeah.